<laughs> That's downstairs in a sock in a cupboard, but I can go and get it. Okay. This one is the Olympic medal and it's lived in a sock ever since I got it because they, um, they chinked quite easily and I was advised when I got it that living in a sock is the best place for it so my mum donated me a very expensive sock and here it is. So this is my special one <laughs> that will forever be my special one. <laughs> I'm Vicky Holland, Rio 2016 Olympic bronze medalist and 2018 world champion. I've dreamed of the Olympics since I was six years old. I watched the Barcelona Games on TV and whilst I didn't quite understand everything that was going on, it was enough to get me fired up and to know that it was something that I thought was really, really cool and if there was any chance that I could go to an Olympic Games and I could win a medal, then I really wanted to pursue that. The Limp for Christie winning the 100 metres is absolutely the, <clears throat> the event that triggered it for me. I remember vividly being in my living room and my mum being sat on the chair next to me and getting so excited and fired up and I misheard his name and I thought he was called Linford Crispy. So I remember just losing it and running around the room going, Linford Crispy, Linford Crispy. Um, but I, I absolutely remember that as a six year old and the excitement of watching it on TV and also the feeling in the room at home of people feeding off that. Um, and that really just ignited a fire. In Rio, I came third and honestly my first thoughts when I, when I crossed the line were it was such a mixture, it was relief um, that I'd actually delivered. Um, it was a little bit of guilt because I had to have a sprint finish with my training partner and my housemate at the time and only one of us got a medal. Um, it was joy that I'd achieved what's really been a lifelong dream. I'm now 35, I probably won't get another Olympics after this year and I've really put everything into being at my very best for one last go at the Olympic Games. Um, I've been really fortunate, I've, I've won a medal at the Olympics but I'm still hungry, I still, I still want to achieve, I still believe that I can, I can be better and on a day like today when it's really, really cold, we even had some snow earlier today, um, bitter wind, you know, that's what gets me out of bed, that motivation to, to try and achieve more. And I think regardless of the Olympics in any kind of racing format, I feel like I still haven't quite reached my ceiling. Um, I think I'm probably quite close now, um, but I still feel like there's a little bit more inside me if I keep pushing on. And yeah, that's what, that's what drives me. A typical training week for me looks like around 30 hours. Uh, that tends to be 27 to 28 hours of swim, bike, run, with two to three hours of gym strength kind of work on top of that. I tend to do 16-ish hours on the bike each week, um, close to eight in the pool, and then the rest is on the run. That is quite low run volume, but it is the easiest way to get injured running, so I try to keep as much of my aerobic time swim and bike, and also the swim and bike are relatively weaker areas for me. With running, virtually everything I do is done on feel. Uh, all my steady runs are definitely done that way. Uh, at the moment, I do one tempo build run each week. So I start off pretty slow and I build up to a tempo that I feel is, is strong but manageable. And that is basically exactly how I feel. That's not done on pace because I run on an off-road muddy course. So you can't really take into account pace. As I go through the year, that'll adapt a little bit and I'll do some stuff on the track where yes, we do look into pace a lot more. Um, on the bike, I tend to watch my heart rate a bit, mostly just on my steady rides to make sure that I'm not creeping into a zone that's not going to be beneficial for me. And in the water, I guess it's um, a bit of a combination again of feel, of pace, of heart rate. It's the whole mix really that I think makes the, makes the programme work. Yeah, so we're here at the pool now. We actually enter uh, via a back entrance here. The front entrance of the university is closed. Um, there's very few people who are allowed in at the moment. I'm really lucky that I'm one of those. So I get to continue with my training while I'm here. Um, as soon as I get through this gate, my mask will go on. I try and film a little bit so we can see what the protocols are that we abide by once we're in. And yeah, I'm off for a hard swim. I tend to swim between seven and a half and eight hours a week, uh, five swims a week, 
Um, there'll be a mix of some days long aerobic swims that are maybe six and a half kilometers. Um, the shortest I'll swim is probably about four kilometers, but that would include a hard set in the middle of it. Um, two days a week we do real aerobic swims and then the other three there'll be some kind of quality whether that's top end speed or threshold. Um, today was a, was a sustained effort for 1500. So we're back out into the corridor following the uh, runway signs again at the university. All the Hall of Fame. I'm up there somewhere, but you can't see it. <laughs> and then we now leave. We don't go upstairs at all, which was the way we always used to come in and come out. And instead, we come out the little fire escape here and back into the car park. And it's snowing. It's snowing actual snowflakes on my face i'm gonna put my face mask back on for warmth i think <laughs> so that's what swimming's like in a pandemic i don't really measure my training in uh, miles or kilometers because one kilometer is not equal to another kilometer especially when you live in a hilly area road surfaces are different all that kind of stuff so we work basically on hours and for me a usual week is about 16 hours. I try and do as much of that as I can outside but obviously during the winter that's not always possible um, and this year especially we've had some pretty brutal weather just a lot of rain a lot of really icy days so when it's been like that I've had to do quite a bit more indoors and so this was a bedroom in our house that we just put some matting down on the floor and <laughs> made it into a bit of an inside gym just so that it was a bit of a nicer place for me to come and come and ride my bike got a tv set up and yeah but i've been in here many hours this winter already i would guess somewhere between 50 60 percent of it's been indoors so far this year for me riding is the probably the hardest of the three has been the hardest of the three for me to get to a level that I'm happy with. So the hard sessions are something that I both relish and do dread a little bit. Sometimes I find myself falling into the trap of comparing what I can do to what I know other athletes might be able to do. So sometimes I do get a bit nervous or a bit more worked up about a big bike session than I might do about any other kind of session. But I have to then just bring it back to me and remember that I can only do what I can do and I can only try and be better every single day than I was the day before and give everything I've got in that one training session and some days it'll be really good and some days it won't be so good and that's okay as long as I'm putting the effort in and sort of believing in the overall overall goal at the end of it. <laughs> the data that's really useful I guess after we race is the power file from your bike. You'll be able to see when you were pushing the highest powers, when you were maybe struggling, you can correlate that to what the power data showed you, where your limits really lie. I think a race is always the biggest test of where your limits are. You can test and test and test in training, but there's something a bit different about a race scenario. That means that actually you can see what you're really truly capable of by analyzing your power data afterwards. I think I'm quite good at balancing my work and professional life with Reese. As many people know, he's my coach, but he's also my husband. But then we've been together for around seven years now. So we're very used to each other's company. He started coaching me six and a bit years ago now, um, just on a very casual basis. And then that's progressed to him obviously taking over my whole program and running the training center down here in Bath. So we've evolved slowly, slowly over those years, um, but we're quite good at I think, uh, putting aside th differences that might be professional when we're at training to then when we're at home. Um, we have a very happy home life. We've got our dog as well who, who just enhances that. And I always say that I don't always have to agree with everything he does, but I, I firmly believe that he does everything for me with the right intentions and he wants the best for me and no one else will ever be as involved or invested as him because of him being my husband too. Hi, I'm Reese. I'm Vicky's husband and coach. 
The way we met was we were both athletes training in Leeds. I was still competing, um, still trying to be an athlete. That then progressed into wanting to be a coach and the opportunity to work with Vicky, just trying to help her out with a little bit of programming and, and just trying to help her develop as an athlete was really a kind of a foot through the door for me as a coach. And, and it kind of, I guess, really boosted my coach development, being able to work with an athlete of Vicky's standard. It's absolutely valuable to be able to be on the ground with an athlete and, and that's just being on the ground at sessions, let alone kind of for us living together. There is a real positive to that. Every coin has got two sides and actually it's just understanding that uh, where are the boundaries on that and, and how do we ensure that work doesn't always spill over into personal life. But from a perspective of being on the ground, seeing what's going on, uh, being able to understand how Vicky's doing, it, it's definitely a positive. What makes Vicky so good? I, th I think fundamentally she's been given the ability to A, train incredibly hard. She definitely has some genetics that are born with an individual that she has that makes her a phenomenal athlete and you can't get away from that. But it's been combined with an unbelievable determination to be the best version of herself. And when you combine an athlete who's got incredible innate, natural, physiological ability, an ability to move incredibly well, with someone who's incredibly determined and, and wants to work incredibly hard and that's kind of where you get to, that's where you end up with an athlete who, want, who has stood on an Olympic podium, a world podium and hopefully will do again. What do I think of it? I think Super League as a, as a concept, as a format is brilliant. For me, anything that develops our sport, I'm a fan of. Anything that allows to develop the athletes to get the recognition and then hopefully kind of the financial support that I think the work they get deserves is a, is a good thing. And then finally, I absolutely believe it, it develops the standard of our sport. What Super League has done is it's forced athletes to innovate. It's forced athletes to understand that small mistakes get punished. And that transfers across to the longer formats of the race, whether that's Olympic distance, sprint distance, or even longer again. And so for me, there's, there's a few things that just I really love about it and it's given opportunities to athletes that maybe wouldn't have got those opportunities. The qualifier event has opened the door to an athlete that maybe wouldn't have got World Series starts or Olympic Games starts, but they've gone to a qualifier, they've performed really well and then off the back of it they've been able to maintain a place in the series and for that I think anything that gives opportunities to athletes allows athletes to improve and develop, I'm a fan of. Yeah, I did say that Super League Triathlon is a bit like the Hunger Games of triathlon. I think that came from the elimination element that is big in, in Super League. It feels a bit like you're never safe. You might only make it through one swim, let alone one full triathlon or two triathlons or three triathlons. So it always feels like you're never safe um, and that it is a bit dog eat dog and people are creating new ways to get through transition quicker because of where the cutoff line is and the elimination line is and yeah it's quite ruthless. I think Super League Triathlon is undeniably entertaining. I think our sport is one that's always evolving. We're quite a young sport and what Super League has done is just brought it to a whole new level of, of entertainment factor, uh, bringing different athletes together, showing off people's different strengths, mixing up the distances. I can only think that everyone else thinks it, it's as exciting as I do um, because it gets such great views and people come out to watch the events in their droves. Okay, so these are all medals from either uh, World Cups, World Series, I think that one is Tokyo Test Event. Um, my World Champs uh, medal is downstairs, but this is the actual race on the day. That's the Gold Coast one where I came second, but that was enough to win me the world title. Um, that was Montreal the same year, 2018, when I won. So yeah, there's a, there's a collection. <laughs> That's downstairs in a sock in a cupboard. But I can go and get it. Okay. Okay, so these are my best medals, if you like. These are the ones I treasure the most. So this was the first one. This was Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Uh, I came third and that was, I always say, a real turning point in my career because it made me believe that I could do bigger things. This one's really special. It was a major games. It was my first medal at something like that. And yeah, it sort of kind of turned things around for me. And then this one is the, sorry, it's a bit dusty, the uh, winner <laughs> trophy for the World Series. As you can see, this is the medal that goes with it. It's lost its ribbon, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I look after things really well. And then if I just pop that one down, this one that lives in a sock, 
um, is the Olympic medal and it's lived in a sock ever since I got it because they, um, they chink quite easily and I was advised when I got it that living in a sock is the best place for it so my mum donated me a very expensive sock, um, M&S I'll have you know, um, and here it is. So this is my special one <laughs> that will forever be my special one. <laughs> I don't get it out very often. Um, I, uh, I remember, I think it was actually even before I won it, I remember a rower, um, I saw him speaking at an event saying that when you win one, if you wanna go for more, you almost have to put it away. Because if you spend your whole time thinking about how good this one is, you won't have the fight to go for the next one. So um, yeah, and I don't really know what to do with it. Um, do you just hang it up on a wall somewhere or walk around in it every day? <laughs> I don't really know. Um, so I get it out every now and again and every time I do, I'm always surprised at how heavy it is. Um, it's a really decent weight. <laughs> um, and yeah, it makes me feel really proud. It does take me back to that day and to everything I did in the build up to that day. And yeah, I just hope that I've got it in me to do it again. <laughs> Make sure to hit subscribe to our channels and never miss the pros action.